Um, so, obviously, it's very important for us as Albertans, like Tyler said, to look at the land, but unfortunately, I know more about the ocean, so I'm going to keep talking no, about fine. plastic. Yeah. So, <laughs> according to Bennett and Alexandridis, by 2040, we can solve 78% of the plastic pollution problem with current knowledge and technologies. Therefore, yes, individual recycling does make a huge impact. And when I was joking about knowing the numbers one to eight earlier, that's part of like effective recycling. You need to know where stuff goes, mm -hmm. right? Um, so moving on to the carbon cycles, how is it affected by our human impacts? Are we taking the carbon cycle specifically out of equilibrium? And as I explained earlier, carbon dioxide affects, in, affects the mixing the mixing of the oceans thus the increase of carbon emissions will affect the mixing of the oceans more without adequate photosynthesizers plants and phytoplankton to convert this carbon into oxygen this carbon increase is likely to lead to the ocean devastated devastation i alluded to earlier so plastic is an issue and like tyler said uh, from an economic perspective, recycling is expensive. From a just everyday life perspective, I think we should talk about this a little more. It's really, like, it's not convenient to recycle. It is in Canada, but not to the point where it should be. So, one thing I learned at work this summer from the international staff is, like, those recycling bins that we have, at least in Calgary, they're blue recycling bins, and they say recycling here, and they're for bottles and stuff. All over downtown and all over like the communities those don't exist in like London or in like Paris etc etc because they live a different lifestyle you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and that might be a blanket statement and that might not be completely correct but what I'm saying is we need to make recycling easier for day-to-day -day people right I agree for sure like even we're, we're talking about the numbers one through it and we don't even know mm -hmm. what they are right so that shows that like we're the ones here talking about about recycling and we don't even know exactly how to do it right so exactly i think that's um the biggest thing about this culture shift and about um becoming more sustainable is making it easier making it accessible um because i know i've gone to the recycling depot sometimes and you grab a piece of plastic and you look at it and you go well i don't know what bin this goes in and you just toss it in one yeah but that's not good <laughs> no not at all <laughs> like if we put stuff in the wrong spot then the whole the whole bag can get thrown out so i think um yeah working towards making recycling um easier is is a huge step that we can take right now mm -hmm. and i think Obviously, yes, that involves putting money. Oh, where are you going to get these? this money? Our taxes are going to go up. Bro, we cannot just keep taking and not pay, right? And I'm not yeah. saying we should have to pay for everything. Like, I was talking to this German guy and this German girl at work, and they're like, if you go to a restaurant in Germany and you get a glass of water, you have to pay for that. And I'm like, if somebody asked me to pay for a glass of water, I'd laugh in their face. Like, you're not gonna make me pay for water. That's a human right. <laughs> um, but when it comes to stuff like um, uh, amenities, when it comes to recycling, when it comes to good roads to drive on so your tires don't get popped, that money has to come from somewhere, which is the people who live in the areas. And I'm telling you, like, I don't want to live on a planet with people who don't care about the planet. Because, like, y'all are just going to be killing all the work that I'm trying to do. Not me as an individual, but you know what I'm saying? I think that's mm -hmm. the perspective of the people who are adopting the cultural shift is because how can we look this information in the face for decades and just be like, it's fine? Mm -hmm. so this last part uh, the cultural approach to conservation biology is your section Tyler so I'm going to let you take the lead in. I'm gonna okay the yes we'll get into it so I, I, we, we've been kind of alluding to it um, throughout most of the episodes so far but I wanted to touch on uh, first of all starting out by talking about because um, there's names for like these kind of cultures that we're alluding to so I think mm -hmm. the first one that we're talking about um, this idea that humans are are separate and the earth is for human needs and and we should use what is on the earth uh, is this kind of idea of anthropocentrism mm -hmm. so this is the idea that um, 
It's the belief that value is human centered and that all other beings are means to human ends. Right. So it's kind of this idea that um, we're separate, we're placed on earth, and everything around us is for us to use. Mm-hmm. And I think um, a lot of people have this view because we have become kind of the, the apex um, and we've kind of separated ourselves from earth a little bit in a sense, if, if that, I guess not separated, but kind of put a little distance, right? We live in, we live in our nice homes. Um, we drive our cars so we don't have to walk everywhere, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this this view um, is part of what is leading to this unsustainability because we don't think we owe it to the earth because we were put on this earth to use the resources. So why can't why can't I use the resources? Right. Um, and so I think the shift that we're hoping to push for here is a shift towards biocentrism. Mm-hmm. So this is the idea that humans are um, within nature. We're part of nature. Um, we're animals just like the deer outside and the fish in the creek. Yeah. And we're all here together um, on the earth to coexist. Um, and so I think when, when you start looking at things from, from this point of view, you realize that it is our responsibility to um, pay back to the earth what we take because um, we're not separate, right? We're not anything special. Uh, we're just evolved to have conscious, um, and this has led us to start start pillaging the earth, basically. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's that's just an important shift that we want to see in the culture and shift in people's viewpoints is this idea that you are part of nature, um, and what you do to nature is important and affects nature and affects the ecosystem around you. Yeah. And there's a balance in the ecosystem, and we don't want to disrupt that balance too far because that's going to have some pretty negative consequences. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I read uh, an article that that you sent me about it, and I think it had one, it had a few good quotes. Um, and so the first one that I wanted to start with, uh, it says, we have turned wildlife and nature into commodities. Mm-hmm. And this view takes away from the two, true beauty and purpose of nature. Right? So what we have humans have done is 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 looked around at the earth and said well what can we use this for what can we use this to make our lives better how can we turn this wood into a house so that i don't have to live outside yeah um and everything has become a commodity um to the point where you're trying to sell stuff on the earth right you you get your commodity and you sell to someone else to make money because money seems to be the the ultimate goal um and this has has taken away from the true beauty of nature, right? We don't um, appreciate it as much when we just view it as a commodity. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the mountains and you, um, are you looking at it in terms of, wow, this is such, such beautiful nature, or are you looking at it and going, well, I know there's coal in this mountain. So if I just dig a huge hole in it, I can get the coal and then I can sell the coal and get a bunch of money. Exactly. So, and I think that's, that's sort of this capitalist um, point of view and, and the greed that has been describing us or, um, driving us to to kind of destroy the earth around us and Mm -hmm. and this is why we need this shift in viewpoints um to really turn back and appreciate nature and see what it does for us and and learn how we can fit in to nature in a way that is sustainable Mm -hmm. um do you have anything you want to add to that i just think it's very interesting because If you're trying to adopt the perspective of we are one with nature, we are coexisting with the natural world, like you said, a lot of people see the anthropocentric viewpoint. Um, And Mm -hmm. I don't want to dig too far into this, but I think it's because a lot of those original lessons, depending on the version that you're reading, are taught in a lot of, well, not a lot of, I can't say that, in the religious texts I've read, which are the Bible. It's uh, like humans were put here to have dominion over the plants and the animals and the natural world, etc., etc., right? Yeah. And I'm not saying there isn't value in that. Like, we do need to peacefully coexist, but 
why can't we have a mutualistic relationship with the planet as opposed to being like six foot tall parasites and yeah, there being yeah. a billion of us? <laughs> and I think um, I'm going back to that, that religious aspect. Yeah, it says we were put to to have dominion, but it also says we're supposed to be stewards of the earth, right? Mm-hmm. We're supposed to take care of the earth, right? Just because we have dominion over it doesn't mean we should destroy it. <laughs> no, exactly. Because um, Go ahead. No, no, that's that's most of what I. Mean. I was just going to say because it was gifted to us, depending on how you see it, depending on whether it was the formation through a black hole and the colliding of two meteors in a huge, a vast nothingness, or if it was a big person in a vast array of nothingness that just made it appear. It doesn't matter. It was gifted to us. Yes. It houses us, and it houses everything that we love. It houses the people we love. It houses the animals we love, right? It houses the Wi-Fi that I know that everybody loves, so I don't <laughs> understand why we're not treating the world with the same respect we would with somebody that we love that much, you know? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, yeah, that's an excellent way of looking at it, right? We're we're not something special. The Earth is something special. It's a gift that we received, and... Yeah, we might have dominion over it, but we should still be taking care of the gift. You don't uh, get a gifted car from your parents and go crash it into the bushes because you have Are control you over get it. Another right? one? You, yeah, you, you, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> right? You, you want to keep it because it's yours. <laughs> and I think for the car example, that's why I think it's so much so important for this information. To be passed on to people because in the car example if you put two grand into like say a six grand car you're gonna treat that a lot better than if your parents just dropped that six grand car on your lap right so this information that we're giving you should be stoking you to become those stewards of the earth and say this place is provided for me at least in my case and tyler's case for 22 years what the hell can i do for it for the rest of the time i'm here right exactly right yeah Yeah, so I think, I guess we'll move on to uh, another quote that I got um, from the article. It says, if our culture proves incapable of preserving other forms of life in the wild, we will lose our only means to understand the great mystery of life's emergence and diversification. We will doom ourselves and our descendants to ignorance of the roots of our existence. Um, So this is... Yeah, so it's looking at it from from more of this uh, evolutionary sense where, um, yes, we've evolved to the point where uh, we have consciousness and and we've kind of um, exerted control over the earth. Um, But part of this is learning what we came from. Mm -hmm. And so if we uh, can't preserve the other life forms on earth, then we stop being able to learn about what we came from. Um, so it, yeah, if we, if we pillage the whole earth, then, then we don't get, um, we don't have that fossil record to learn mm-hmm. about the past and we don't have animals to experiment on, to learn about evolution, uh, and stuff like this. So that's looking at it from more of a, a, a scientific perspective, I guess, on, on part of the reason why we should preserve is so that we can actually learn about the past. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and I think that's vital, and we will talk about that when I start another Zoom meeting, because this one's <laughs> going to end in 10 minutes. So, under that scientific lens, what is the importance of that fossil record? Well, think about it from the uh, perspective of mass extinctions. So, carbon dating, which is, I'm not going to explain carbon dating to you in full layman's terms, but... Carbon dating is a process that they use to understand how old fossils are, right? So in this carbon dating process, they can also date other minerals. So let's say, uh, I need to look this up quickly. Actually, Tyler, can you do it so I don't move the uh, screen? Volcanoes produce a bunch of methane, right? Uh, Yes, volcanoes do produce methane. Okay, so let's say in the Triassic, or the Permian, and I'm just pulling those because I know those words, I don't know the dates, period. There was a, like, a bunch of volcanoes became active. I'm talking about, like, 40 volcanoes in a span of kilometers, just like a stretch of mountains became active. They exploded, 
Then a bunch of volcanoes all over the Earth exploded in reaction, and it killed all life on Earth. There was a mass extinction there. The increase of methane in the atmosphere is going to get trapped in the bones of the animals during the fossilization process. So scientists can go back and say, wow, there was an increase in methane during this time. Maybe there was a vol massive, or sorry, an increase of volcanic eruptions that killed the entire planet. And then they can look and see what was going on with the natural process in the world during the time to see what led to this. And this type of uh, reverse thinking to guide our forward action, you see it in history, so we avoid wars. So why can't we do it when it comes to the environment? Exactly right. Learn, learn from your mistakes, mm -hmm. right? Or learn from others' mistakes, I guess. In this case, um, yeah, the past is is a very valuable resource um, to learn more about the future. Exactly, and obviously, yeah. you can't live in the past because we have the technology of now and the knowledge of now. But if you ignore the knowledge of the past, then you're doomed to repeat those mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. So what's okay, the last thing I got um, in the in the cultural sense? Uh, I found it very interesting. at At the end of the article, uh, they started talking about how um, it's important to realize that that ecosystems um, are in a balance. So mm -hmm. when you look at um, one species going extinct, you think, "Oh, oh, big deal! It's just one species." There's a million or three million. I don't know. I don't know how many defined species we got now, but we got a lot. Um, but it's important to realize that that species is part of an ecosystem. Yeah. And it can be a really important part of an ecosystem. So <clears throat> even one species becoming extinct can affect that whole ecosystem um, in, in various ways. Um, so I should have maybe looked up a good example to go with this, but I didn't. No, it's um, okay. I have I, one. I got your back. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Hit him with it. Okay, so uh, what he's talking about here is a keystone species. So, like, in ecological interactions, there's species in the environment where it's like if we took them out, the food web would fall apart. There are ecological interactions that they're part of that are vital. So, one that I know off the top of my head is in the rocky shore environment, um, sea urchins are um, keystone species. And when you introduce... Uh, Oh, what are they called? Patrick Stars. Starfish! Uh, when you introduce <laughs> starfish to a place where there's a bunch of sea urchins, sea urchins are going to get outcompeted and they're going to get eaten. And then if the sea urchins are being eaten, well, then the barnacle populations are going to explode. And it's like a snowball. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and so that goes to... Um, the idea that if, if we want to conserve species, it, it goes the other way too, right? So if we want to conserve a species, we also have to conserve the ecosystem surrounding. Mm -hmm. So you can look at something like this for a wetland. If you want to conserve a species that lives in a wetland, well, obviously it needs the wetland to survive. So it's important to conserve all the other species within that wetland to give it the area that it needs um, to survive. So I think it's, it's going back to that biocentric view and realizing that everything is connected on the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and we're part of that. And if we sever too many of those connections, well, it's not going to end well for us because at the end of the day, we are still reliant on the earth and we need it to produce um, what we need. Exactly. Just like that wetland species needs the wetland, we need the earth to be able to continue to do what it is we do. And that's why I think philosophy is so sick is because you could say, ask the question well what are we meant to do and that's a whole nother episode a whole other <laughs> conversation but the way we've been living so far as it is right now i gotta protect what's important for me and mine forget about you and yours has changed our environment our culture and just the world in general astronomically so obviously change is the only thing that is inevitable that's a quote by heraclitus um i'm not saying we're just going to ignore the fact that the world is changing as we find these technologies we need to adopt them we need to utilize them but we've made all these leaps and bounds in the scientific research and obviously the younger people listening to this you guys are going to make more so shout out to you guys <laughs> but uh we also need to take those new technologies and use them 
to repair the problem. Because if we're just going to compound the problem, one day we're going to wake up and the sun's not going to shine. And then what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, I just remember I have two more things. That's to okay. Add. Um, so the first is to address uh, another worldview that actually I used to have before I listened to a podcast called The End of the World with Josh Clark, which I would recommend. With who? It's a very good Josh podcast. Clark. Josh Clark. Yes. Um, Nick recommended it to me. So shut up, Nick. Um, and in that, he talks about this idea of techno optimism. So this is the belief that we're going to come up with. Um, technology to solve all of our problems. Mm-hmm. And so we, we've seen it in the past with the food crisis, right? We came up with, with GMO foods and now we can sustain so many more people, right? Uh, and I think a lot of people have this belief that, oh, it's not really important because we'll just come up with, with some sort of technology that will clean the carbon out of the atmosphere um, and everything will be fine. And I think it's important to realize that you can't make that assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, just because something has worked in the past, it has no bearing on the future. So you can't assume that we're going to come up with the correct technology in time to save the earth, right? Maybe given enough time, we could come up with it, Mm -hmm. but, um, it's still important to try and sustain until either we have that technology or, um, yeah, I guess sustain until we we could figure out a technological way to to solve the problem. Right, and like in ideal scenario, you wouldn't need the technology, but this is an ideal scenario. This is real life, and that's and that's what I'm saying. Because I guess there's no guarantee that we ever will come up with it either, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, it's it's not something that you can hold to. You can can't you can't rely on techno optimism. You can't rely on us creating technology because there's no guarantee that we actually will. Um, so I think that's an important thing to note and something that I found interesting anyways. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And the last thing, um, this comes from my Enviro class. So shout out to Dr. Greg King. Um, there's this site called footprintcalculator.org. Um, and so basically what it does, you enter in uh, a little bit of information using little slidey things. It's kind of fun. And it tells you um, about your, your footprint on the earth and it'll give you, um, how many earths it would take to sustain us if everybody lived like you. Oh my Lord. Yeah, I know. It's kind of scary. So I did it, uh, and I got, uh, I think it was 3.4 earths. Holy. Um, so if everybody lived like me and we don't have, this is of course, without any changes, um, we would need three and a half earths to support Oh, mine's going to be like 67. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So um, it's it's very, very fascinating. Um, so I recommend doing it just to kind of give you a sense of, of in Canada, we are privileged and, and we, yes. we do consume a lot. Yes. Um, so it is important for us to make a change and Canada isn't better than than any other country. No, we have just as much learning to do as everybody else does. Yeah. So uh, that was one fascinating thing I wanted to add in, but... That's that's all I got for my section. No, that's okay. So, from the conversation that we've had over the last however long, because uh, it's three recordings and I can't check how long it is, um, what are the through lines that I've attached to? Do you need to recycle? Do you need to have natural awareness to be a good person? Depends on your definition of good. Um, but in our purview and in the world we want to live in, we do think you need Um, what can we do to facilitate this cultural shift? Oh, I guess the second point is a cultural shift is needed for this type of thinking to be adopted and accepted and employed by everybody. Well, we need to start having these conversations and realizing just talking about it isn't enough. We need to start acting. So in terms of the action, what can we do? Well, at the highest levels of government, they need to make these type of things like recycling, like composting, etc. way more accessible. And you shouldn't have to reward us because the reward is getting to keep our planet. But if you have to incentivize somebody with the 10 cent return policy, then you have to incentivize somebody with the 10 cent return policy, right? Like you got to do what you got to do to get the people doing the stuff the people need to be doing. Also, 
If you're listening, don't use that as an excuse not to recycle. No. It doesn't make any sense. Just because it's not easy doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Oh, and (laughs) one thing, uh, these through lines are good and I'll continue here, but we didn't talk about that I do want to talk about is the Jenny Ocean Cleanup Project. So the... At the end here, Tyler gave you a recommendation for a website that's going to educate you. Now I'm going to rec- give you a recommendation of somewhere to put your money. This project is putting boats in the ocean with basically like a reinvented fishing net to get rid of the Texas garbage patch. And there's an eight minute video that I'm going to link that Tyler and I have both watched that you guys can watch. And if he finds a way in the third system, so they're on the second system right now, to update it to the third system to make it as big as he wants it to and to employ 10 of these every five years they can get rid of the pacific garbage patch and i think the time frame was like 20 years i don't quote me that don't quote me that because i don't watch know. the video exactly the moral of the story is is this project these are the type of things that we need to put our money and our time into I'm not saying we don't need oil and we don't need natural gas to survive as people. We do. But if we're going to become economic people as well as cultural, or sorry, economic, environmental people and conservationists as well as economic, spiritual, uh, mental, and physical people, then we need to start adopting these values into our everyday lives. So... Putting your time and money, if you have extra money and you're like, hey, I need to donate to a charity. I don't know if this is a charity, but you're donating to the survival of our planet, which I would argue is just as important. Yeah, and I think uh, an important thing to note out of that is he's also turning all the plastic that they pull out of the ocean into these plastic pellets um, that can be sold and turned into things. They did a project on sunglasses. I don't think they're going to continue doing it. Yes, and they're designer sunglasses that the company did, but these pellets can be put into like those razors, those single-use razors, right? And stuff like that. So he's showing that there is value in in recycling, right? This is economic. Like you, you can make money by taking the garbage out of the ocean and turning it into something usable. Exactly. And like obviously what Tyler and I said earlier, you have to spend the money to convert the waste into a usable product. But if that's where we start making our money and that's how we start living and basing our economy, our world's going to become a better place. We're going to create jobs that people need. And obviously this isn't going to be a wake up and the world has changed type shift, but got to do it one day at a time. So is there any other through lines that you saw Tyler that you want to add that I missed so I talked about the good person thing I talked about um, I honestly don't even the culture shift the culture shift and then I don't remember the last one what is it recycling Uh, oh the accessibility of recycling yeah accessibility of recycling I guess just appreciate the earth, guys. It's Mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you guys to to spend some time outside and just take a moment to to actually see what's going on. Look at at the beetle in the grass or look at the deer in the field and and appreciate um, that, yeah, we're part of this ecosystem and it is beautiful and it's something that's worth seeing. Exactly. So I think that's a great note to leave us on. You finish this podcast, you hopefully feel invigorated or a little frustrated. You're like, oh, I got to save the earth. I got to be better. Now shut your phone off and go spend time in the earth, in the natural world. Perfect. Awesome. Those of you guys who are listening, I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of The Fork in the Road. And Tyler, thank you very much for taking the time to do this with me. Anytime, anytime. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, of course, man. Door is always open. All right. And that is that. Right on.